Hello again, lovies. It's David McGillivray here, <laughs> horror icon and comedy legend, coming to you with another edition of Little Did You Know, uh, the chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting. I hope you agree. Now, uh, a couple of words um, about the, the look of the show uh, today. Um, it's new and different. My green screen has been spirited away and instead I'm au naturel, so to speak. So now you can see me in my study and what's that behind me? It's a poster for Peter Jerome, grandfather of gay porn, which is a peccadillo release. Now, another couple of things. First of all, um, about the uh, the music that introduces this series. We've had requests about it. It was composed and is played by James Sterland, who is 11 years old. How about that? And um, the first edition of this show, which was all about censorship, was interrupted by a, a commercial for a peccadillo release called The Prince which is now in trouble with the censors. That is a complete coincidence. It's funny the way things work out. Enough of that. Let's get down to my guest today, who's waiting in the wings and indeed in a shed. Um, he's a um, broadcaster and a presenter and recently, well, over the past few years, has been uh, developing as a comedy performer. Um, we're going to talk about his show Bunk Bed and many other things besides. Will you please say hello to the very wonderful Peter Curran? Hi, David. <laughs> you are indeed in a shed. I'm so pleased. I want to know what you're doing in there and what is behind you. Uh, well, um, first of all, I take uh, great exception to be described as a bit of a comedy performer. I have I have never aspired to anything other than mild amusement. Uh, so, um, but behind, yeah, this is my um, glorified shed. I've got a, got a couple of sheds. This is where um, I work from and do recordings from. And it was an old broken down shed um, that I bought off somebody and assembled um, from bits, basically over over the the uh, period of about three or four months. And um, yeah, so behind me you've got um, I think keyboards and uh, drums there's no bbc box there poster yeah just you kind of general detritus of making stuff really you a broadcast from your shed is that because at the moment you're not allowed to go into broadcasting house well no i you are allowed uh, because um as a trained journalist reporter um I, i'm considered um part of a semi-essential industry so if you're a broadcast journalist, you can still go into studios and uh, and work, obviously observing um, strict protocols about COVID safety and so forth. But yeah, I, although I, I mean, I've, I've swerved most things and done a lot of stuff remotely, sending uh, microphones out to people and getting them to you know record at home. And uh, but I was up, I was thrillingly um, invited to record in London last week in a in a studio. And uh, it was a, it was a, it wasn't the most intimate experience talking to someone twenty feet away, uh, but um, we we managed to create whatever warmth we could. Um, but um, yeah, so and I suppose a bit like yourself, David, one kind of shapes things into a, sort of a tolerable way to to keep working. Yes, take that, COVID nineteen. You won't stop us. Now, when I first knew you, you were very fresh faced going back a few years. Uh, so Daddy. tell me uh, what inspired the beard? Did you just wake up one morning and think I'm not going to shave anymore? No, it was um, it, it, it's the uh, probably the last refuge of an aging fatso uh, to try and lengthen the face, probably. And in fact, I, I, it was much bigger than this is a, a regrow. This is uh, Mark II, I've had one for about three years, and then in a, in a fit of peak during lockdown, a bit like um, Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, I shaved it and any remaining hair off so I could stride about the garden, uh, enraged and crazed uh, by lockdown. Uh, but I've started to grow it back now, and um, hopefully the face lengthening will take place over time, David. 
the shape is absolutely magnificent as far as i'm concerned keep it just like that now uh peter Curran, you were uh brought up in uh, belfast and it just occurs to me that you were uh, born at the right time because if you had been born uh, a couple of generations earlier you would not have been allowed to broadcast nationally with your lovely accent uh, uh, did, did you know about that oh is, is this the uh, infamous broadcasting ban instituted uh by prime minister thatcher oh. back in the day no it went oh no 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 it went way back before that everybody speaking on national radio had to use so-called received pronunciation oh indeed yes yes of course regional accents weren't allowed no i know unless you were commentating on the rugby mm, borderline borderline uh, or doing the weather as a treat can can you do an english accent I can't, David. I can't. I'm entrenched in the regional. It's all the rage. Can you do a Welsh accent? No, you're pushing your luck. I refuse to take off other nationals' accents, apart from uh, the English accent, of course. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, uh, born in Belfast, but fetched up in um, uh, London. Oh, well, round about, what, 1992? How did that come about? Oh, no, I, I, I arrived in London in the early 80s um, and uh, with a, a lot of people from uh, Northern Ireland, really, because um, things were fairly atrocious there. And also it was, you know, uh, there wasn't tons to do apart from be terrified most of the time. So I came over to London and I worked um, as a furniture fitter and carpenter for about seven or eight years on, on building sites and refurbishing listed buildings. And then just there was a recession um, around 1990-91 and that enabled me to have enough time off to volunteer at the BBC's local radio station, JLR. And I was able to uh, work with some lovely creative people uh, like Gloria Abramoff, who um, allowed me to light Tommy Vance's cigars for him or make him coffee as he presented Drive Time. And that, that was really my entry into to radio. The great thing about um, then was that I was able to go down into the basement studios and experiment and play and teach myself basically how to, how to make things in audio and i don't think you'd be allowed to do that now you were learning on the job well we're certainly going to come back to glr in just a moment but i wondered whether we would skipped over another period of your life when you were what the americans call a roust about you helped with fairground construction or did you Yes, um, I did. I uh, worked on um, piers along the Jersey coast um, from Atlantic City down to uh, Wildwood, New Jersey. Wildwood is the kind of Blackpool of Philadelphia, um, uh, as sort of Blackpool would relate to, you know, Manchester and, and, uh, and Liverpool. But basically, uh, yeah, lots of people from Philadelphia, uh, the city, and some from New York as well would go down onto the uh, Jersey coast. And I um, worked on a number of um, carnivals and on the boardwalk uh, rides, such as um, the big parrot ship, that huge thing that would swing back and forth mm -hmm. and terrify people. And I would also work on the go-karts uh, as well. But it was fantastic, you know, if you're a young guy, 18 years old, first time in America, it was a brilliant way of uh, feeling that you were in American graffiti or, you know, an, an equivalent movie about American youth culture. And were you one of those uh, cheeky chappies who span the cars on the waltzer to make the girls scream? Uh, no, didn't quite do that, but I did help girls uh, and indeed boys um, operate the uh, go-karts because often they would stall and I'd have to go over and get their engine started or, or um, adjust their steering belt or how they address the steering wheel and help with steering and so forth, push them and get them going. And uh, I wasn't alone. There was quite a few people managed to, um, we did a nice trade in uh, tickets 
that had already been handed in and then we resold to Beach Bums who fancied a bit of a ride uh, with tickets not uh, garnered from official sources. So it was, it was brilliant. A nice a touch, yes. And is, the, is that where you developed your uh, love of the United States? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I suppose it, it was a kind of Xanadu from uh, being a kid and watching films, uh, even watching movies with my mum, black and white uh, movies, film noir, that sort of thing. These Saturday morning films. America just was this uh, incredible exotic place. And then, you know, seeing sort of early 70s, you know, when Scorsese and Coppola and so forth and that new wave got going. Uh, when I got to uh, visit the States and the first time in 1980, it just felt like a set from some of my most favourite films. So I loved it. Um, well, you've been back uh, subsequently uh, many times to make programmes. We're going to come on to that. But first things first, you did mention uh, GLR, where you learnt your craft as a, a broadcaster. Now, um, this is where I come into the story. It's not about me, of course, but I was working... As if? <laughs> no, no, no. I was working for GLR's predecessor, BBC Radio London, which in all honesty was a bit of a joke. But then GLR came along and... Um, that was notable for the number of people who started on GLR as broadcasters and then became uh, famous. I mean, w would you care to uh, drop any names, Peter, apart from your own? Well, uh, you know, I, I was just um, gobsmacked at being uh, in a lowly position, but working uh, on the same show as great radio innovators like Chris Morris and Chris Evans and Danny Baker. Uh, just a, a fabulous place to be uh, trying to learn your craft. And uh, the, the, the celebrities were both sides of the microphone as well. And uh, as you've said before on other shows, these incredible international celebrities would just pop into GLR's office in Marylebone if they had a, a show or a record to plug. That sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. No, I mean, it, we were very lucky in the sense that um, when I started uh, doing a show there um, late nights on Sunday, you know, the graveyard shift, I mean, it was literally me. I would have to get up during a record and open the back door to let a guest in. Um, so they really were throwing the resources at me, David. But um, it was brilliant because uh, a lot of the people who worked um, at GLR, both as producers, you know, behind the scenes and in front of them, were fans of culture. They loved books, they loved films, they loved music. So unlike um, a pop a doodle do guy um, who was uh, just the do the show because it's about me, mate, and um, we sort of scoot across the surface, we actually were getting to meet some of our creative heroes. So people were always guaranteed a, re a pretty thorough interview uh, from people who had actually were immersed in their work say that the normal junket circuit wouldn't wouldn't expose um, creative types to, from uh, particularly international ones. Were you ever struck dumb because you were so in awe of somebody who was sitting right there in front of you, who you'd always admired? It, well, many times, but you, you kind of get over it. I mean, Anthony Burgess, um, obviously, and Kingsley Amos, um, but Al Pacino was the one that who commented on my um, awestruckness, and uh, he saw that I was. I mean, I must have been. I was trying to look calm, but he must have seen some unease uh, or nervousness, and uh, he just said, as a record was coming to an end and we were about to start the interview, you know, what's wrong with you? And I sort of said, well, I'm really nervous. Why? And I said, well, because you're Al Pacino, I'm just an actor. You know, you've interviewed lots of actors. And um, uh, he didn't have quite that accent, but uh, you get the idea. It was, um, so it was, it was, you know, that, that was one time. It was, he was so lovely to reach out to this terrified young radio presenter uh, and acknowledge his, uh, his radiant fame. Was it that interview in, in, in which you were able to persuade him to do what we call a trail, which is a, a, a trailer for your own show? Yes, he was very kind. Um, I don't think he'd been asked before. I suppose if you're Albert Chino, you don't get Herbert saying, could you do a trial for my show, Al? 
and um, he duly did. And also he did, um, he was kind enough to do an answering machine message for my answering machine at home. So that was good. So I, I had Al Pacino saying, hi, this is Al Pacino. Peter Curran is out there somewhere. Leave a message um, for, for many years. And then I just, it became embarrassing. Um, it became a bit, you know, really one, you know, uh, well, I don't know. JLR was the sort of place that encouraged you to do a good job, but it didn't. Um, it didn't encourage you to be, um, you know, a celebrity DJ, if you like, in that sense. It it, it went all the uh, the way of all, it went the way of all flesh. It metamorphosed into another radio station, which is now I think called Radio London again. Mm. Oh well, progress. Now um, you were interviewing all all these. Uh, um, I thought. All I'd, right, have you got another call coming in? Sorry I'd, to keep you. I thought I'd muted all my alerts, and of course I forgot to switch off that one. Let's go quit. Okay, that will not happen again. This is, this is the punishment for hosting your own show, and you get a call. You have to take the call or the message. I'm not going to take another call while I'm speaking to you, Peter. The very idea. Um, you you interviewed so many musical uh, celebrities. Your taste in music uh, must be eclectic. Is that the right word? I, I, I would say so. Um, uh, I have denied myself nothing. Oh. Uh, but... Um, yeah, no, it, well, it's just as a kind of, I, I mean, I, um, I, I played uh, music in bands for, for many years before I started playing on the radio. So um, it was a kind of relief to finally stop hoping to become a pop star. Well, actually, I stopped doing that, but I still had the pleasure of music. But it was great to sort of put that behind me and then dive in completely into the amazing works uh, by by lots of different musicians, and you you know it was really nice to do it for the living in the in the sense that you were paid essentially to dig stuff out, um, sort of pre internet. You did a lot of mooching around um, record shops uh, to find um, tasty things to to play people. You, uh, do you still do that? Do you well when they're open mooch around? Yeah, not as much really. No, not as much. It's almost. Um, it kind of hurts, you know, if you're not playing music every day, uh, or, you know, on a show, uh, then, you know, you can get preoccupied with other stuff, you know, you, uh, you just get involved with other things. So I still do raids on, um, on charity shops. I uh, must say there's no seaside town remains untouched from my busy fingers. Um, when indeed the, uh, the, the secondhand shops are, are open. But um, it just it's it feels funny sometimes when you pick up a really glorious stuff and it's just you sitting in your own chuckling it away, chuckling away at yourself uh, at how good it is. Is your record collection in the other shed or what? Um, well, it's some of it's in the house, uh, some of it is here, uh, and some of it is in is in the, the other shed. It's not that vast, to be honest. You know, I, I'm not. Um, I don't have racks of alphabetized uh, records at all. I mean, in a strange way, one of the reasons why I got the gig on GLR was because I had a good contemporary record collection for for a guy that was in his twenties, and most of the people in the station were in their you know late thirties. Uh, so actually, it was good to be able to bring something um, uh, to that. So I've essentially got. I mean, it has expanded a bit, um, but um, yeah. Uh, I have no interesting payoff except to say that I've I've kept uh, my record collection modest. Me too. It's in the other room now. I wondered if you had any artifacts uh, with you. I mean, what I'm personally hoping for is um, the autograph from Peter Cook. But if you haven't got it with you, <laughs> can you at least describe it? Um, yes, um, uh, the, I interviewed Peter Cook, um, uh, mid nineties and he came in wearing a spectacular pair of rainbow, uh, colored tracksuit bottoms and, uh, and a, and a formal tweed jacket, which was quite a look. Uh, and he had a fag on the go and sat down. It was, you know, wonderful to, uh, talk to him and, uh, I said, look, would you mind signing this for me? And so I, I duly produced this uh, 
I think it was a Derek and Clive video, and he sat down and um, he looked like he was taking a bit of time over composing a message. And uh, so I was delighted. I thought it was maybe some personal tribute or some kind, you know, I've always loved listening to your show and so forth. So he passed it back to me. I, I didn't look down, shook his hand, saw him to the door and came back. And um, he'd just written fuck off, Peter, on the uh, on the cover. It, I still treasure it, of course, because I know what way he went. I know what way he meant it. That's a, that's a wonderful Peter Cook story. I can't match it. Um, we're going we're going to take a break in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to mention the word Siberia to you in the hope that you'll know what I mean. It's spelled C-Y-B-E-R-I-A. Oh, you have memories of that? Siberia. Was that an, the first Internet cafe in London? Correct. Oh, yes, I filmed in there. Wow, blackmail corner. Yes, we 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 did. Um, I think it was the first show on British television to have uh, streaming um, video, uh, inter internet uh, viewable uh, video. Fascinating. We must have been there uh, around the same time. Um, this was London's first internet net cafe. You were streaming from there, and I launched my anti-censorship magazine scapegoat uh, from there let's get it in the right position there it is um it came out in 1995 so that's when i was in siberia i didn't know what the internet was in those days um uh, but uh, nevertheless i was persuaded to launch this magazine there and this is where i say patreon subscribers can get a free copy this is where a link comes up there it is and that's enough of the plugs. We're going to take just a brief break now for a trailer from our lovely hosts, uh, Peccadillo Pictures. Uh, it's a trailer for a film called Canary. Enjoy this and then please join us again in just a couple of minutes. I was the postman. I was the postman. Ik denk, het is niet gemakkelijk met enig een van ons niet. Maar als hij tenminste bij de Canaries kan inkomen, dan zit niet een paar drie terug in stieren van de raagheid te halen. Nationale dienstplicht is een voorrecht. De volgende twee jaar gaan we samen werken, woon, eet, zweet, ontspan en aan bed. Je wat hier zit, is ons uitverkoren is. De Canaries van 1985. Canaries! Oh, no! Are you from a sick? Yeah, boy. Amal sê jylle is a koor uit die jemelheid. A engele koor. Geliefdorps en trots. En die pad is jylle moffies. En, jy my sê? Sodra jy koukie oopstap, dan blijf jy hier weg. Oe, van het gaan al jy weer jou. Jy is ons al vir die wekte. Ek weet nie... Wat jy volgende gaan wil sê nie, maar ek wil dit nie hoor nie. Ons moet die oorlog tot aan die einde toe vecht. Want hoe nader aan die einde, hoe feller sal die totale aanslag van die duivel word. Ons sê dit die voor... Wat ons doen is onwettig, Wolfgang. Ons kan troep toe gaan. Ons sê nie koor, maar ons het nie stem nie. Uh, that's uh, that's Canary, and I have to say, um, even though um, Peccadillo are our host, the, the, uh, some of the best films I've seen um, recently are coming from South Africa, so don't miss Canary with a K. Um, my guest today on uh, Little Did You Know The Chat Show is um, Peter Curran, and in this section of the show, I want to talk about just some of your programs on uh, TV and radio, can't mention them all, alas, too many of them. But let's uh, start with one I have never heard, and this is a regret because I want to find out more about it. Now, you managed somehow to um, get Spinal Tap, um, the fake rock group, back together again for a show called Back From The Dead. Mm. How did you manage it? 
Well, uh, I have known Harry Shearer, um, who is the bass player Derek Smalls in Spinal Tap for a number of years. In fact, on my GLR show, he was our American correspondent in the early uh, 1990s, and Harry would do these brilliant satirical takes on on uh, American news for us once a week. And uh, when Spinal Tap were rumored to be getting back together again, um, I got in touch with him and said, uh, "What about doing a, a you know a docu, a mockumentary, uh, a full documentary? I think the the boys prefer to call it rather than a mockumentary." And so Harry was game, but he had to do a bit of persuading with Christopher Guest um, and Michael McKean. And they uh, very generously said, yeah, they wouldn't mind. So I, so I went over to the States and um, trailed along behind them for a few dates on their American tour, the, the Spinal Tap uh, reunion tour. And I uh, was able to make a documentary for Radio 2 about it with Alison Vernon Smith. Um, so it was it was interesting to say the least. Not without its challenges, David. What because of the people involved? Uh, the logistics of turning something around very very quickly, and um, also doing it in the states. You know what? Um, they were in the middle of a tour. It would have been great to get them at you know at the start as they were rehearsing. And in fact, Harry rang me at one point and said, um, "Why are you not over here now?" Paul McCartney is rehearsing in the next studio and has been coming in to sit in with us. <laughs> but I had to wait for uh, the BBC uh, budget department to uh, allow the flight to America to be authorised. Uh, I mean, now, of course, I would have just jumped on the plane and gone over and sorted it out later, you know, got a, a budget flight. Uh, but then, of course, I was um, more deferential and in awe of the uh, glacial speed of uh, financial departments. Please tell me this uh, program is archived. It ha hasn't been wiped, has it? No, no, it's it's uh, it's around. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe Radio Radio 2 actually repeated it. Uh, they repeat it every couple of years. Um, so, uh, yeah, and there's some nice sort of outtakes. I did quite a long uh, group of interviews with each of them. And I've got, I mean, some of the outtakes are, are fantastic. Sadly, not broadcastable at that time. Um, but uh, they certainly make for uh, a uh, spicy late night listen if they ever uh, come to air. I'm going to uh, hunt that out. And I think everybody else should too, if you haven't heard uh, Spinal Tap Back from the Dead. Let, let's stay um, in the States at the moment because I want to talk about another programme you did there. It relates to a very, very old programme in which uh, somebody in New York sent back reports every week. And this was called Letter from America. Your version is called, this is very clever, Litter from America. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about the title. The shows are all so-so, but the titles are good. Titles are great. Tell me what this one was about. Well, the idea uh, of this was to do night walks with well-known creative people in the United States. And it wasn't so much of a tour of the place as a tour of them and their own scuffed and stained American dreams as, they, um, as the Trump years got underway. And uh, we had Richard Schiff, who, uh, the actor who played Toby Ziegler in The West Wing, and this fantastic um, comedian and disability rights campaigner called Maysoon Zaid uh, was there. And uh, the third of the trio was Kwame Akwe Armav, the director uh, and writer. Uh, and we spoke to them respectively in Baltimore, New Jersey and Los Angeles. How did you put this team together? Uh, I, <laughs> I've, I've played golf with Richard Schiff a couple of times. Oh. I'm afraid it's cheesy inter show biz incestuous horror show as you would uh, uh, as much as you would like. So uh, Richard was happy enough to to uh, to take part in this, and he's a really fascinating guy. He's very politically um, eloquent, and and he's been a passionate campaigner for for years. And um, uh, Kwame was just, I just approached him directly and he, was, he, he loved the idea because he had a lot to say about being 
uh, a black British man in America, and particularly that idea of he would speak in this in, in a very um, uh, kind of cultured English accent, and America um, was certainly probably still now, but certainly sort of uh, five or six years ago, America they thought they the thought was that um, um, white America was more superior to black America, but white America was inferior to uh, England, to Britain. And so you got this uh, black man, but with a, an immensely uh, cultured English voice. So as he said himself, people would just look at his mouth when they were talking to him going, you know, this doesn't compute with how I arrange people in my world. So he was he was fascinating um, just about being um, not only a sort of a Brit abroad, but that whole idea of America in turmoil and what uh, the Trump presidency revealed uh, about the states for good and bad. And Mason Zaid, which is an amazing um, comedian who um, did Muslim Funny Fest, that was her event in the States, and sort of opened this in the teeth of a lot of prejudice in the United States, particularly um, after 9-11. And um, she was in the middle of a, a tour and she'd had to get security um, at her gigs because she was getting death threats um, from people um, and part of this was enabled with the kind of resurgence of um, the uh, ultra-right wing and um, racist tendencies uh, in America around 2016-2017. Uh, um, but she was very, very funny as well, and particularly talking about how, um, you know, straight, uh, how able-bodied actors in America would play the disabled uh, characters, disabled people. Um, so the, the, it was a great time to take the sort of temperature in America, but through a very personal lens, as it were, with each of these people. You could take that temperature again now, couldn't you? Yeah. Yes, a uh, fluctuating temperature, I would say, at the moment. What happens if I say the word foghorn? Uh, foghorn is, uh, well, the, the object is one of the most um, uh, beloved things uh, of the... Uh, on natural world, um, that uh, since childhood, since being listening to a combination of gunfire echoing off the Key of Hill in Belfast, and the big deep sonorous voice of the foghorn on Belfast Lock, with like some reassuring dinosaur kind of uh, letting its voice boom um, up through the streets. I've just loved um, foghorns, and so. Uh, I was able to make a program about uh, foghorns with the uh, brilliant Sarah Jane Hall um, a few years ago. And um, then when I started making, producing programs myself, uh, the little company that I do it through, I decided to call it Foghorn. And not terribly imaginative. I'm basically a child who have, who's been saying, I, have, uh, I love foghorn for 50 years without interruption. Well, you, you, you're not alone. Um, and, and until I discovered your program, I didn't know that. I don't know what it's like in Northern Ireland. Tell me about that. But apparently, there are no foghorns operative in in uh, in Great Britain at the moment. Is that right? Yes, they, they do um, let them all for fire them up, um, let, let the machinery go, and and let the big acoustic blast happen for visitors sometimes. But they've largely uh, been replaced by uh, GPS navigation um, or, or by um, automa automated um, fog signals. Uh, the days of um, a, a, a jolly old um, fellow with a beard and bandy legs scooting up and down the stairs, setting the light and the horn going are, are long gone, sadly. So you've, you've answered my question. I was going to say, what? <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I hope it's not what I know. Oh, no. oh, <laughs> don't let's go there. Um, uh, that's why we don't have foghorns anymore. Didn't I? Yeah. Didn't, no, I didn't know. Um, we're going to end up by uh, talking about um, bunk bed, but just before we do that, um, I want to know uh, because, in fact, you were due to do this interview last week. You couldn't because you were presenting pick of the week. Now. Mm -hmm. Uh, who don't know this is a program on radio for it's a selection of the presenters favorite programs now 
How does it work? Can you just say, well, I definitely want to feature this program because I heard it, or are you told what you have to include? Or, as I suspect, do you ask for suggestions on Twitter? Or is it a combination of all three? Well, that's a very fascinating and multi-layered question there, David. Let me try and answer it. Um, what I'd say is that um, you, the choices are, are down to the presenter uh, in as much as they want to listen. So I suggest about 20 programmes and then the producer uh, comes in with, you know, another 10. And so between the, you know, all both of us, we kind of whittle it down. And also you get uh, listeners suggestions, which are, are often uh, brilliant because um, they've picked up something, particularly from a live programme. And Twitter's good. Um, you, you know, if you want to hear from uh, presenters and producers coyly promoting their own programs and saying, if you wouldn't mind casting an ear, which is which is absolutely fine too. OK, that answers that. Um, uh, but let... <laughs> I love, can I just say about your, your kind of demeanour as a chat show, I love the sort of finality with which you come back on things. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a... It's a good, it, it's an exercise of of um, interviewing power that power that we normally don't see. Most most interviews are appeasers, but here you are saying that answers that, which of course just uh, brings so much um, uh, encouragement to the uh, to the interviewee. I'm glad you approve. Um, uh, I don't know where it comes from, Peter. This air of finality. But it's partly looking at the stopwatch and knowing <laughs> have to move on. Now, this is why I was rash enough to call you a, a comedy performer, and in my view, a very funny one as well. Okay, so again, for those who haven't heard, we're up to, am I right, seven series of Bunk Bed? Yes, the series eight um, begins in, in January 2021. Glad you mentioned that. I'm going to let you describe what bunk bed is. No, I'm going to let you describe what bunk bed is. I can very briefly, and of course, it won't capture the flavour. It's two men talking in bunk beds in the dark. Um, That's exactly what it is. Yes, um, it's myself and Patrick Marber. Um, who uh, and we build um uh, we actually because of health and safety we can't have the beds on top of each other but we are in two beds in the studio in the dark um talking to each other okay so the, you know so many questions the, the first one was going to be are you actually in the dark tick you're not on top of each other why is that oh because of health and safety why pardon why? Where does health and safety come into bunk beds? Kids can go into bunk, bunk beds. Um, yes, but if a kid falls out of a bunk bed, um, they're not going to sue their parents, are they? Or their parents aren't going to be prosecuted for having uh, unsafe sleeping practices at home, are they? Whereas, in fact, if you're recording a, a program uh, that's broadcast on the BBC, you have a long list of things to achieve in terms of uh avoiding accidents uh basically but well, you can't pay an absolute fortune in insurance premiums if you're a small independent company in order to cover yourself or you can simply put the beds beside each other at opposite sides of the studio and in the dark and everyone is only one or two feet from the ground and we're all safe i'm tempted to say that answers that because it does it's to stop you falling out of the top bunk and then suing somebody okay uh, the other man involved is patrick marber where did you meet him uh we met um at the uh cafe of uh, a diy store in uckfield in west sussex that's not very glamorous is it you could have dressed that up a bit <laughs> No, it was, it, was, it was dressed down to the point of ridiculousness. Um, yes, because I'd um, interviewed Patrick um, a few times uh, about uh, plays and films of his that he'd written that were opening. And so I bumped into him and we uh, went for a coffee. Uh, we both lived in Sussex. And 
uh, we, we met again uh, and then we thought about the idea of it's interesting to have uh, sort of free uh, rain rambling conversations that um, is there would there be a way of doing it that wouldn't feel like a broadcast that was low energy that was naturalistic and when we came up with the name bunk bed then that's when it clicked and then doing it in the dark um uh, i just tried because i thought it'd be amazing if we couldn't see each other because you know we help each other out conversationally with little nods ticks smiles and so forth what if what you say just floats into the air and you don't know what the person thinks of what you've just said you have to wait for their response so that and also the idea of lying on your back uh it sounds different um to you know if you're you're sitting upright and also you know because of the the circumstances there have been occasions when we've actually fallen asleep um so you're you're lying next to each other and are you in the pitch black or is there a little green light somewhere no it's it's pitch black <laughs> okay okay and how much of what we hear was improvised um, it's all improvised. Um, and we just record for very, very long sessions. And then I edit it down um, into a symphony of light and shade, hopefully. But um, yes, it's it's all improvised. But in a way, in the sense that that's how it's written. Um, I mean, it, effectively, it is written in the end because it comes down to this sort of tight 15 minutes that hopefully flows and explores a number of ideas. But um yeah it's it's improvised uh 15 minutes cut down from on average how much material um two to three hours oh, no really yeah. yeah how difficult is it to cut that down to 15 minutes well um it's in, it's it's difficult the way i do it is um because the sessions um i, I chop everything up um so from say say each two hour session uh they'll be chopped up into uh little kind of um sections um then you might get about you know 60 or 70 from that session uh and then uh what i, I kind of arrange it like a patchwork so often an episode of bunk bed will contain things that were recorded at completely different times different conversations so that's the idea i suppose that's the writing part of it in a way that um, it's sort of composed from all those little separate elements rather than just editing down two hours. It's, it's um, um, hundred. I know it's pretty, it sounds pretty mad and laborious, but it's, it's hundreds of little um, tiny frag, audio fragments stitched together. Well, um, but I mean, there's, there's a method to the madness in the sense that we wanted to feel um, like random thoughts occurring to us the way they do before you drift off to sleep and your mind gets into a sort of blending um operation uh and so that the, the that was the idea that that would create um a sense of that rather than a kind of a linear conversation that developed bunk bed is uh, back in january i'm very glad to say and that thank you where we have to wind it up now i told you the time would fly but am, am i allowed to say um peter that you you weren't that sure about doing this show i i had to use an element of temptation oh what was i can't remember what what was on offer uh have i missed out should have been, what what did you offer and what should i be insisting about now of course i i offered nothing because that's <laughs> me but you know, you were saying, "Oh well, I don't think I'm really very interesting. I've got nothing to say." Well, you know, I, I think sort of hearing people um, talk about their work, it's fine talking about the work. I often think that um, the people behind the work are a bit snoresville. Uh, uh, so um, I'm glad if I've if, if I've fulfilled the brief of chat show guest, I'm I'm delighted. I'm glad you did it, uh, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. A pleasure, David.
I'm glad to hear you say that. It's all we've got time for here on YouTube, but Patreon viewers can join us right now for an extra bonus 15 minutes of material. But for now, from us, that's my special guest, uh, Peter Curran, in his man cave, and me, David McGillivray. Just say something, Peter, otherwise we won't see you saluting. Oh, you goodbye. Say something, otherwise <laughs> we don't see you. Goodbye. Thank you very much and goodbye to you, Peter. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Join me again next week. For now, however, from me, David McGillivray. Bye.